the next speaker I have for you is very exciting. You may have recently seen him on Ancient Aliens who, on the History Channel, which he was a consulting producer for. He works very closely with Eric von Daniken, one of the oldest, longest, and most famous uh, proponents of the ancient astronaut theory. He's the, chen the chairman for the Center for Ancient Astronaut Research, that is part of one, uh, one of the projects Eric von Daniken does, and he's the publisher of the Legendary Times magazine. I'm proud to introduce Giorgio Tsoukoulos. How you doing, everyone? Everything Great. good? Great. This is one sweet Thank setup, you. huh? Yes? Hello. How are you today? Thank you for sending me lovely inputs. I was also studying with Eric von Daniken. Really? My Fantastic. I appreciate that very much. So, uh, wow, what a great turn up for a Saturday. Pretty awesome. I just stepped off the plane from Phoenix, Arizona, where I filmed my third episode of UFO Hunters right. in front of some petroglyphs. And uh, the show will have a very fast turnaround. So three weeks from now, it'll air on the History Channel, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. So please tune in. All right, without further ado, we have a lot of slides to go through. So let's just start. Oh, and uh, welcome to everyone watching worldwide on the web. It's pretty awesome that uh, Jason Martell has set this up and with such sweet technology that, you know, it actually works, which is great. So, whoa. Sometimes the mic works a little too well. You can still hear me though, right? So, all right. So, let me just, uh, okay. Let's do it the manual way. There we go. All right. Eventually, mankind will venture into outer space because we are a species of explorers. So right now, the space, the ISS is being built. Eventually, the space shuttle will get improved. Eventually, we will go back to the moon. This is actually a, uh, a concept of what the next moon rocket will look like. And here's a comparison with uh, the, the current space shuttle. And all the way to the right is the, uh, the moon rocket that we'll use in about five years. And to the left is the Saturn V, Saturn V, which, which went to the moon back in 1969. And as with all things, we'll start out really, really small, set up a couple of, you know, components up there and start mining and so on and so forth. But then as time progresses, our base will grow bigger and bigger and more sophisticated. This looks like almost like the Death Star in Star Wars. So, I mean, obviously these are all concepts and ideas. This is not, you know, a concise vision of the future, but this is something what might occur. So then, after we've built bases on the moon, the next logical step will be to visit Mars. And we will do this with uh, more sophisticated ion-propelled uh, spaceships. We'll start small once again, and then expand our bases on Mars. And then we are truly <coughs> visiting the final frontier, deep space. We will go out there. I'm not saying it's in 20 years. I'm not even saying it's 100 years. It might be in 500 years. And that's just the reality of the level of technology that we have today. But when we arrive, oh, by the way, in order to get there, you know, the critics always say, oh, the distances between the stars are too big. So what will happen is that we'll use something like a generation starship. And that actually has been conceptualized already in the 60s by NASA. So this is not some, you know, people talking out of their behinds. I mean, this is really something that has been mathematically constructed and proven that when you have a generation space, that, that, that the distances between the stars are big. And with our current technology, we really can't get any far, you know, can't get far. So what will happen is that not the same crew that will go out there will actually return. It'll be four or five generations after. So you're basically procreating on board of the spaceship. In order for this to, to happen, the spaceship would have to have artificial gravity. 
And one way of creating artificial gravity in outer space is if you have a round wheel like this that's you know, uh, rotating on its own axis, and uh, thus you create artificial gravity. So it's basically like living you know, in this big gigantic wheel. And on the inside, it would look something like this. Again, this is a concept, this is an idea. You know, the first ones will be much, much smaller than this, but this is approximately what this will look like, and it is all, you know, possible to do this because if you have a wheel that's rotating on its own axis, all the water, everything will be pushed out against the walls. So thus, you are possible. It is possible to, to, you know, for you to walk around, you know, not floating in anti gravity and all of this. So eventually, we will reach a planet. And uh, that planet might host intelligent life. But technologically speaking, that life is not there yet. As in, they're intelligent or you know, pretty much there. However, technologically speaking, they're still primitive. So they might still you know, use flint to make fire. And, and who knows, maybe they, they, they're not even there yet to make fire. So, what will we do? Will we just stand back and watch and say, no, no, we'll have to keep something what Star Trek refers to as a prime directive. I say, no way. Our egos are too big for us to just stand back and say, oh yeah, yeah, let them just toil around. What we will do is we will help them, help them a little bit to push them sort of in a technological direction, you know, teaching them about mathematics, teaching about engineering, about architecture, uh, agriculture, all these different things. And eventually, we will become the gods that have visited their planet thousands of years in their past. And so, this is the basic premise of the ancient astronaut theory. If something like this that we will do in the future, why can't it be that this has happened here on Earth 16, 17, 18, 25,000 years ago? And um, the truth of the matter is that it has. Because here we have a picture of a helicopter landing on a South Island, uh, uh, an island in the South Pacific. And the natives, and this happened in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, where the natives, when the Second World Wars were going, war was going on, and, and all the subsequent wars in that region, you know, the, the soldiers arrived in their planes, and the natives, for the very first time, had contact with, quote unquote, an extraterrestrial society. Now, by all means, they are not dumb people, they are not stupid, it's their technological frame of reference is totally different than what we're used to. So what happened is that if you, by the way, Eric, may I borrow your, uh, your laser pointer, please? Yes. Yeah. That would be really sweet. How are we doing? Yes, yeah, everything is great now, I appreciate that you're 138. That's fantastic. Hey, thank you very much. Okay, now, see, when, when the seaplane landed, they didn't know that it was a plane, but it was a mythical bird. And they described it in their traditions that it's a mythical bird. And mind you, this is all happening, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, every night, the natives paddled out to the boat and right this, this thing right here, that's a pig. So they sacrificed a pig to placate the mythical bird so it wouldn't make so much noise because with the noise, that means the plane, or the mythical bird, I'm sorry, is angry. <laughs> so they, you know, they uh, you know, sacrificed the, the goat, I mean, the, 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 the pig right there. So, I mean, right there, uh, th this is what's called a cargo cult. After the Second World War ended, the, um, 
Uh, the Americans went back home in their planes and with their boats and all this, and uh, 10, 20 years later, ethnologists went back to the island of Vebak, uh, uh, this, this one is, and um, the ethnologists were absolutely astonished because what had developed is this, that people rebuilt planes made of straw, and every night they re-performed these quote-unquote rituals for these mythical birds to take off and to land, for the gods to arrive or to return. Now what we have here in ethnological terms is known as a cargo cult. And cargo cult is the basic premise of the whole ancient astronaut theory. And it basically says, if this was possible in the early 20th century, then why, on our planet, why couldn't this have happened, you know, two, three, four, 10,000 years ago? And uh, what I'm about to show you tells us that yes, it absolutely did happen. For example, India, treasure trove of ancient astronaut stuff. Up here in this painting, you have these gods flying around in what's called a vimana or vimanas, and you have thousands of year old texts like the Vimanika Shastra that anyone can go and read. It's not anything that, you know, was given to the person from a higher being or from a higher plane of, or, or was channeled or anything like this. No, it was written down thousands of years ago as it happened in physical form. And uh, this is a, a reconstruction of one of these Vimanas, but it had, you know, these propellers inside and, uh, you know, we have to remind ourselves that those things, in, in most of the cases, were not high-speed devices, especially the Vimanas, because many of them were literally just dirigibles. You do it because there is one theory that says that some of these space travelers essentially crash-landed on our planet. And uh, this is basically what happened, so they had to live out their lives on, on this planet, and instead of uh, keeping to themselves, they made it their mission to help uh, whoever was around them, and they visited you know, the better parts of the world with these vimanas. And of course, there are other stories of high-speed craft that I'm going to refer to later. Again, here's another painting, and you know, there's thousands of these references of flying machines in ancient India and other cultures of the world. In ancient India, there's a, a story that three cities were orbiting the Earth, and they all got destroyed in an epic battle that took place between gods and men, or as I would like to call it, between gods and gods. All lowercase g, by the way. Let me let me take this, you know, away from the very beginning here. When I talk about gods, it's all lowercase g. It has nothing to do with the divine, with the spiritual. Those were all misinterpreted flesh and blood extraterrestrials that our ancestors thought were divine in nature, not because they were dumb, but because their technological frame of reference was different that we ha than what we have today. Another key phrase is misunderstood technology. So, like I was saying, I mean, you saw in the previous slide this one right here, you know, these uh, house, houses up in the sky and floating around, and, and that was India, and this here, for example, is Central America. This one here is China. So all over the world you have these beings that descended in heavenly chariots and taught mankind in various disciplines, like I was saying before, you know, what we would do on another planet. We would teach them in mathematics, in engineering, in agriculture, all these different things, providing they need our help. I mean, if they're as advanced as we are, you know, we would move on to the next step of, you know, exchange of information, exchange of knowledge. And if they're more advanced than us, well, then, uh, hey, can you give us some tips? Absolutely. So here are some uh, quick slides. I'm just gonna show you about the whole misunderstood technology aspect this one here is South America. This here is Japan, the Dobu statues. I mean, if you look at this from a modern day perspective, what did the human artist try to depict here? 
or you know, tried to skull. Was it really something that you know the night before he got drunk and he was on drugs, you know, smoking all the weed that he could, you know, smoke, and then he came up with something like this? I say no. I mean, of course, our ancestors, you know, uh, they celebrated with alcohol and they, you know, took copious amounts of drugs. However, in order to come up with something like this or with something like that, where you have a human face behind this mask and there's a cable or a pipe that goes to some sort of a tank and you have some fire breath right here and here you have some weird device that they're carrying around here's a close-up also same here and you have all this really space age modern looking you know garments then my question is, was it really just a figment of their imagination or did they see something and it freaked them out so much because it was something foreign, something novel, that they had to put it you know, in, a, in a sculpture for future generations to see. And that's exactly it, because all these monuments are very ancient <coughs> and it takes a lot of time to make all these things. So if it, wasn't, if, it wasn't, if it hadn't been important, then there's no way that our ancestors would have put in the time and effort to create all of these things. Here, see, this guy's manipulating some controls here on his uh, chest thing. These two items were actually shown in ancient aliens. And, you know, I mean, the mainstream archaeologists actually say, when I, when I ask them, or any of you say, well, what is this? Oh, this is a deity. It's one of the, it's a depiction of the gods. And then they walk away and they say, case closed, mystery solved. Well, no, this is where the questions begin. What gods? What is trying to, what did they try to depict here? Where did these gods come from? Again, lowercase g. <laughs> so, you know, uh, here we have another one. I mean, very similar to a modern day astronaut I mean, it's uncanny. It's the logo for Legendary Times magazine. Here, this guy has some wings. He wears a skull cap like Apollo astronauts upon liftoff. Boots, some suit. There's some pipes coming out of his chest. And, and again, some sub type of a, a pack that is on his chest. And, uh, you know, if some say that, you know, oh, th those were just the only examples that I could find. Well, there's more. Here we are in Tikal, Peru. I mean, Tikal, Guatemala, and uh, this is a stele that was found recently, I mean, a uh, uh, hundred years ago, and uh, you have this guy that wears mittens, some type of gloves, and very technological, mechanical looking type of suit with these wrist, wrist uh, bands here, or whatever, whatever have you, and many people ask me, what is this? And it's basically this pipe, this, this cord that goes into a tank. Again, down here, he's wearing some type of a suit. And look at these futuristic looking type of boots here. I mean, to any human who has never seen an Apollo astronaut or a space shuttle astronaut, you know, coming out of the, the holding area before they board the bus to be driven to the space shuttle, I mean, that must be amazing for, I mean, Let's remember how we were as kids when we saw astronauts. It was the best thing on the planet. It was absolutely exciting. And um, so this thing right here, in fact, I have a, a clip right here. This is the original. You know, archaeologists say that this thing in the middle that looks like a, some sort of a tube that goes to a canister is the spine of uh, that uh, whatever is depicted on here. Now, if you have a spine like this, and am I on camera? Where, where am I, by the way? I gotta move over this so everyone can see. So if you have a spine like they claim this is, then you would have to walk like this. I mean, <laughs> because the spine is carved, it goes, you know, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous to, to have a suggestion like that. Here is the Hindu god Ganesh, which is always depicted as an elephant. Today and over the last 500 years, Ganesh was depicted as an elephant. But this is one of the earliest representations that we have of Ganesh. Does this 
look like a trunk to you. It looks more or less like some, some type of, uh, again, some sort of tubing. It goes to a canister. And again, Ganesh, according to the Hindu traditions, has arrived from outer space, from the endlessness of the dark nothing. I mean, that's just an, uh, you know, an old, inter or, or old saying for, for you know, deep space. This is a, a depiction of, uh, that can be found at a monastery in Yugoslavia. Impossible. Thank you very much. Does it still exist, by the way? Yes, it does. Wonderful. Like that. Did they protect it? Yes, it does. Good. Excellent. It's a UNESCO case. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here is something that uh, I'm very fond of because this is a, an object that was found in Colombia. It's about 1,500 years old or older. And uh, there's many of these that were found. And uh, archaeologists say that this is nothing more but a stylized fish or a stylized insect. And uh, these are all the ones that have been found, including the one here with the propeller. I mean, these are all ancient. Now, does any of these look like a mosquito or a fish to you? Please. You can find these in various locations throughout. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and all throughout South America, um, Colombia. And um, so Dr. Inboom and Peter Belting, he is an Air Force controller in Germany. And uh, Dr. Inboom is a dentist, a doctor. So both these people have very sound minds. They're not, you know, uh, out there, so to speak even though what defines out there anyway. So they actually recreated this model right here. I mean, they're about, this is a replica right here that has been taken off the mold that's at the Smithsonian right now. There's literally uh, hundreds that have been found, but only these here look like actual aircraft. All the other ones do look like frogs, do look like birds and fish and so on and so forth, but the fact that there's others like this means that there is that these have to be viewed from a separate perspective than the other ones. Because if I may go back one more, just to point out one more thing, uh, in nature, birds don't have an upright tail fin, they don't have stabilizers, and most importantly, see where birds and also uh, any flying animals have their wings is where we have our shoulders, okay? Well, this here, you know, d doesn't come out, you know, where your shoulders are, except, especially, you know, th these things right here. I mean, this is a complete delta wing right here. You know, and some have, su or, or this one over there, some have suggested it's a, it's a, uh, a stingray, and, and things like this, and you know, it's all conceivable, but you know, if something smacks you in the eye, don't fight it. So, here actually, Eric talked about this earlier. This has been found at the Istanbul Museum, and so because Eric talked about it uh, a few minutes ago, I'm not gonna repeat anything about this, but uh, it, it's uh, uncanny, you know, the exhaust back here, some sort of a headless spaceman sitting inside a capsule. And uh, one of my favorite topics, Puma Punku in Bolivia. If you have nothing to do this summer, go there. Or actually go in uh, this coming winter because if you go this summer, it's summer here and winter there. So just wait till winter here so it's summer there. Puma Punku, 14,000 feet altitude, like right next to Lake Titicaca, next to Tionaku, which is a tourist site in South America where literally dozens and dozens of tourists every year come and they photograph the gate of the moon and the gate of the sun and then they go home or go back to La Paz and uh, they're nothing the wiser. However, only 150 yards away is this, Puma Punku. And you have all these gigantic stone slabs that at one point all fit together. However, even the natives say that they, when they came onto the scene this place was already in ruins. Mainstream archaeology says, mainstream archaeology says that 
All of this was built by the Aymara Indians. And I think we'd all agree in here that if uh, you would build something like this, you need planning because each piece goes, goes somewhere and they're like Legos. I mean, they all fit together. Uh, and, you know, you have to have some sort of a planning idea of a blueprint of where it goes what and so on and so forth. Now, the Aymara, uh, the mainstream archaeologists agree on one very crucial point, that the Aymara have no writing. They didn't have a script. So archaeology also proposes in order to build something like this, you need writing. So they're, they're refuting their argument, their own argument. And the heirs of the Aymara still live in this neighborhood. So when you, and they're very proud of their traditions, they're very proud of their history. If you ask them, hey, who built this? Was it you? No, senor. It wasn't me, or it wasn't us. So who did it? Los dioses, and they will point to the sky, the gods. So what we have here is living mythology, where just like with Native American myth, which we'll get into later, uh, you still have oral traditions that have survived hundreds and thousands of years. And they all maintain the one thing that a long, long time ago, the quote unquote heavens opened and the gods descended from the sky, the teachers from, of the sky are the guardians of heaven and they taught mankind. So going back to these whole, this whole Puma Punko and Lego thing, these pieces right here, are all in a row, and but nine of them have been found. And years ago, we went up there and we took concise measurements to see, you know, what would happen if we were to create a computer model with this. And uh, to make a long story short, by the way, this is the back, the, the, the T shapes and, and crosses in the back. They actually fit together like Legos, creating an impenetrable wall. And anyone who has seen Ancient Aliens a few weeks ago, they created this really awesome animation of all these pieces fitting together and creating this wall. Um, look at the intricacy of the cutting techniques. Talking about the cutting techniques, all these stones up there are made of granite, andesite, and diorite. The only stone harder than those three I just mentioned is diamond. So the tools, the inescapable conclusion is that the tools must have been diamond tipped. And mainstream archaeology tells us, oh no, this was all carved with chicken bones and with obsidian. <laughs> many, many, not some, it is not some, I can tell you that. But you're right, you're right. I mean, there, there is a paradigm shift happening, even among academia, which is, which is great. So, oh. And of course, how were all of these big, gigantic blocks transported? Mainstream archaeology, oh, let me, before I move on, just to show you how intricate the cutting techniques are and that all of this had to do something with some sort of a uh, technical nature. Look at this fine line. Chicken bone. Yes. <laughs> I mean, what is this? It seems as if this is the female part to a male part that's missing somewhere. And th this looks very much like, you know, some electronic uh, stuff that we have today where, where you hide your cables or something like this. So, by the way, if, if you were to go there and, and run your thumb down this groove, you would cut yourself. That is how perfect it is. It looks very coarse, but that's because of years of weathering. The actual surface, when you go touch this, it's like a bathroom mirror, which means that the stone might have been vitrified, and you only achieve vitrification if you apply, or I mean, if you expose the stone to extreme heat. 